As the largest worldwide conflict, World War II impacted fashion in different and interesting ways. These are the top 10 unusual fashion trends during World War II. And if you know something that should belong on this list, let us know down in the comments. Alright, number 10, clothes rations. As the war raged on, there was an immense amount of pressure placed on clothes manufacturers. Uniforms had to be made and maintained, and the increase in air combat required a surplus of parachutes, while the variety of environments required different materials for survivability's sake. As a result, in 1941, the British government introduced clothes rationing, where a number of coupons would be allocated each year. Different types of clothes would be worth different amounts of coupons, with 66 coupons given for every adult at the beginning of the rationing. As the war continued, this allocation began to shrink, and in 1945, the regular amount of coupons given per person was 24. Despite the war's end the following year, rationing continued until 1949 as the economy recovered, but had laid the foundations for a different type of fashion, generally in the style of informality. Number 9. Patriotic Knitting One of the more fascinating results of the wartime strain on clothes was the way in which it changed hobbies into forms of support. In the end, as husbands went off to war and wives asked how to help, the answer was given that they ought to knit. Evidence for this can be found in some fascinating wartime propaganda, which honestly deserves its own list. But my absolute favorite might be the poster asking if you remember Pearl Harbor and answering itself with Pearl Harder. Despite the cute ways in which the activity was promoted, knitting did end up having an effect, as even prior to Pearl Harbor, Americans were knitting sweaters and mittens to be sent off to the Eastern Front. Arguably, the fad peaked when Eleanor Roosevelt was photographed knitting for the war effort. As a result of this, some women had reportedly begun friendly competitions based on quantity of clothes knit, with one Scottish woman even hitting around 1,000 pairs of mittens by 1941. Number 8. Fashion is out of fashion Other ways in which propaganda was set in favor of rationing was through the manipulation of what is considered fashionable. The effects of this will soon be seen, but one of the oldest publications in the history of fashion coined a phrase that caught on like wildfire. Fashion is out of fashion. While this leads more into the ways in which propaganda can allow for significant social changes, and it's also something that no one, not even you, are immune to, it's interesting to point out how wrong this was. Rosie the Riveter, for instance, was a remarkable piece of propaganda that's synonymous with the entirety of the Second World War, and yet she's presented in a way that is still somewhat fashionable. Thin eyebrows, applied makeup, and styled hair. All of these are things that you wouldn't have seen in a wartime factory, but it worked as intended and allowed for an increase in patriotic fervor far from the front. Number 7. Blackout Buttons When German bombers began to make strikes on British cities, a major problem was coming to be more common. With the increased availability of electricity, it was then easy for bombers to pick electric power plants as targets, and eventually they started hitting their marks. A city under siege and darkness will be prone to mass panic and the fatalities that commonly occur with such things, and so a plan was devised to make for an easier transition. UV absorbing buttons and pins were created and distributed, some materials even making their way into the fabric of clothes as a whole. As a result, accidents were reduced in blackout conditions and the material continued to be produced post-war with hobby figurines. However, more darkly, the material did make it easier to identify bodies in the collapsed rubble of homes. Number 6. Dog Wool After the implementation of clothes rationing, women who were not prepared to face the shortage ended up having to get creative. While the practice had begun in a minor way at the tail end of World War I, in 1941, business was booming in the dog wool industry. And it was soon discovered that some breeds' furs were better for spinning than others. Labradors and Spaniels' fur didn't work so well, and despite their visual similarity to sheep, Poodle's fur was the worst of all. The best breeds ended up being Collies, Sheepdogs, Chows, and Pekingese. Even with that, the trend died the moment clothes rationing ended, likely to the dog's satisfaction. And our noses. Number 5. Viscose Rayon well documented in the book Fake Silk by Paul David Blanc, when the world went to war, the commodity of viscose rayon saw a massive boom. 
However, the method of creating the chemical links in order to build the viscose rayon was extremely toxic, resulting in an unprecedented loss of life as the effects were felt in the 60s. This was felt in particular on the Axis side of power, with prisoners of war and political prisoners being forced to produce the material at an extremely high rate. The conditions were so bad that reportedly, German factories implemented nets around the second floor of the buildings to prevent their workers from taking their own lives. Number 4. Make Do and Mend Another excellent wartime piece of propaganda. This piece was yet another effect of wartime clothes rationing, generally focusing on ensuring that civilians made their clothes last as long as possible. Make Do and Mend was a social movement that hoped to lighten the impact on morale. The general idea started with simply using whatever materials you had to fix any clothes that were damaged, but eventually it spiraled into homemade fashion. Initially, it was simply done by wearing soldiers clothes while they were away, then turning worn down clothes into new clothes, then making clothes out of food bags or belts from cellophane. Reportedly, few husbands ever noticed. Number 3. She Wears the Pants Hard to imagine now, but work with me. Back in the day, women wearing pants was a bit of a faux pas. But as the whole patriotic utilitarian image crept into popularity, most of these social conventions were demolished. Interestingly, post-war there was an immediate push to return to these established norms, which was fought against vehemently. With nearly a decade's worth of time to become entrenched, the social pushback was difficult to justify beyond the general aesthetic means, as men just wanted to see women wearing dresses again. The counterpoint was that it was still a nightmare to get any clothes at all, but it was also pretty fair to state that pants were just fairly comfortable. Just one more of those little pushes in the direction of increased autonomy. Number 2. Uniform Hierarchy An interesting note was in the cultural impact of how men's uniforms were perceived by prospective wives. As it turned out, there was a sort of hierarchy to how men were valued that was separate from their actual rank, and it was entirely determined by the color of their uniform. With the British military, the PBI, which stands for Poor Bloody Infantry, were at the bottom of the barrel, also referred to as the brown jobs. Then there were the naval officers, who were seen as quite fetching with their dark blue uniforms. Further up than those was the Royal Air Force Blue. In at number 1, Woodies. When Japan entered the war, their stranglehold on rubber made the material virtually impossible to find. As a result, the supplies required to produce the soles for shoes dwindled, and the search for new material began. According to Harper's Bazaar, the material ended up being wood. Woodies, as they were called, were a strange type of shoes and apparently difficult to wear when compared to most other shoes. So much so that magazines selling them apparently had to publish guides on how to properly walk with them. Thank you guys so much for watching. Please remember to like and subscribe. I'm Adam Andrews, this is Bumblebee. Have a good one.